<laughs> All right, this morning we are back in the tabernacle. So if you can open up your Bible to Exodus chapter 25. And we're just going to hop again, hop around a little bit in this. And, and thank you for all the encouraging comments that you guys have taken time to pass toward me as we've been moving through some tabernacle content. I trust it's been helpful. I trust it has brought some freshness to a, a section of the Bible. And again, I, I, I highlight this because God did this intentionally. A massive amount of the Bible is devoted to this thing called the tabernacle. Now, even after we get done reading through Exodus, uh, there's a lot left in the Mount Sinai geography that's still going to be about this. And then so much of the Bible is going to spend its time making a point by pointing back to this thing. And, and it's going to point back to it and then teach us something and point back to it and teach us something. And that will continue all the way into the book of Revelation. So this is not an area that you're like, hey, you know, I never knew much about the tabernacle. Well, then, you know what? There's a bunch of the Bible you're reading that you still don't know what that means. So this can't be a casual topic for us. This is a huge, huge topic for us. So we're going to look at the last element of the tabernacle. We've been moving through the, the, the sections of it. And I'm going to make a big deal out of these sections a bit today. So God installed sections in this thing called the tabernacle. And the last one we're going to look at here today is the most holy place. And that's in Exodus chapter 26. Let's just read a few passages here in verse 31. And the instructions on how to build this tabernacle. We get to this last section inside the tabernacle tent. And it says, You shall make a veil of blue and purple and scarlet yarns and fine twined linen, it shall be made with cherubim skillfully worked into it. Right? And this is going to be the veil when we get to the New Testament and the veil of the temple is torn in two from top to bottom. That's this veil right here. Verse 32. You shall hang it on four pillars of acacia overlaid with gold, with hooks of gold on four bases of silver. And you shall hang the veil from the clasps and bring the ark of the testimony in there within the veil. And the veil shall separate for you the holy place from the most holy. You shall put the mercy seat on the ark of the testimony in the most holy place. You shall set the table outside the veil and the lampstand on the south side of the tabernacle opposite the table. And you shall put the table on the north side. Well, Father, as we engage your word again this morning, Lord, our longing is that your word would engage us. Lord, this is an interesting thing about your word. We, we read it, but it reads us and speaks to us because it is alive. And so, Lord, even though these words have been written down for thousands of years, Lord, what we do today is fresh in our hearts and give us eyes to see it. Be in our midst, Lord. Transform us by these words in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> All right, well, this is the section the Bible calls the most holy place. And so we have, we've come from out in the world into the nation of Israel, closer into the court yard where the brazen altar and the laver were and then we passed beyond the first veil into the holy place and now we're passing beyond the next veil into the most holy place and inside this there's only one piece of furniture well you could say that there's two because there's a mercy seat on top of the ark so you might call that two things but in this setting behind this veil is an ark, right? And that's the first thing that God discusses with us. And it's the place where he is going to manifest his presence. And we remember as we get in these details, don't lose sight of the big picture, right? God is installing this tabernacle. Why? Because he wants to be with us. This is his means of dwelling with his people. So the first thing God says, is, I'm going to manifest my life. My presence is going to be manifest among you in this holy, most holy place. Verse 10 of chapter 25. You turn back there with me. You'll see a couple of things about the ark. 
It says, they shall make an ark of acacia wood, two cubits and a half shall be its length, and a cubit and a half its breadth, and a cubit and a half its height. You shall overlay it with pure gold inside and outside shall you cover or overlay it and you shall make on it a molding of gold around it. Then verse 17, so you shall make a mercy seat of pure gold. Two cubits and a half shall be its length and a cubit and a half its breadth. And you shall make two cherubim of gold of hammered work shall you make them on the two ends of the mercy seat. Look down at verse 21. You shall put the mercy seat on the top of the ark, and in the ark you shall put the testimony that I shall give you. There I will meet with you. And from above the mercy seat, from between the two cherubim that are on the ark of the testimony, I will speak with you about all that I will give you in commandment for the people of Israel. So God creates something here. And all these things are teaching us things about God. And that, is, that, that can never be underemphasized because you and I live in a world, and the world has always done this, it wants to reinvent God, we could say, in our own image. Right? God made us in his image, but we want to make him now in our image, after our ideas. And so today, you could have come in here today and based on who your grandmother was and what your aunt so-and-so taught you and what, where you went to school and what you learned in grammar school and where you went here and there, a few things you read, a couple of things you watched on TV, you have balled all that information together and, and you have some kind of way of approaching God. This past week, you approached God somehow. You ascribe to God a particular attitude. God's got a particular attitude about life and about people. It may be really, really harsh. And no matter what you do, you can never be right with this God. Or it may be really, really overlooking. And he's sort of not even paying attention. And you know, it's not a big deal. And people do blind stuff all the time. Don't worry about it. But you accumulated ideas. And now you are approaching God with those ideas. And this Bible is massively filled with this stuff. Because God's trying to teach us some things about himself. And if you read this carefully, which is what the Summer Bible Jam is going to teach us to do this year. It's going to teach us to read slowly and carefully God's word and experience what it's saying. But here's one thing that captures me in this. A couple of nuances here. Almost no one's ever going to see this thing in the nation of Israel. To go beyond that last veil, the priest didn't go beyond the last veil. They went beyond the first veil into the holy place and they served there amongst the light and the altar of incense and they would offer incense to God. They would have been serving out in the brazen altar offering sacrifices to God. But they would have never gone beyond that other veil. Only the high priest went beyond that other veil. One individual... And he only could go there once a year. All the rest of the time. Now, now just think with me for a moment. Because we know that, that gets featured, right? It should. All the rest of the time, this ark is sitting behind that veil. And no one sees it. No one goes near it. No one does anything with it. There were a few individuals that were ascribed the responsibility that when they picked up camp and moved from one location to another, those individuals would package this thing up with the poles and they would cover it and they would carry it. So when it was being carried publicly, you didn't see it. You just saw the poles sticking out of it. Everything else was covered. And God did that. Eric was highlighting this in one of the songs that we sang earlier. I mean, you know that God is okay with leaving some things in the category of mystery. I mean, does this a little confusing? We just read this description. You're going to make this this ornate, beautiful box with these cherubim, these majestic beings on it. And it's going to be trimmed a certain way. And there's details. It's got to be this length and all this finishing it. And no one's going to see it except once a year. The high priest. Do you ever clue into the idea that some things are made for God? 
whether or not you ever put value on them or not. I always loved hearing poetic thinkers talk about the wild flower that's blooming on the other side of the Himalaya mountains that no one will ever see. No one will ever climb around that side and see. But God, God sees it. All right, so we have this idea that everything has to exist for us, right? Everything's got to be something about and for us. But there is some mystery in God that some things he just doesn't go into great explanation for. And yet we're going to approach this God. And this is going to be a key aspect to our approach to God. This once a year experience, right? You have those the cherubim that are part of this image here. How many guys have ever had the idea, right? Cherubim, they're these majestic angels, right? I don't know what you're, you know, growing up, you know, I had ideas about angels. You stuck them on top of Christmas trees. They, they did little stuff. They came around, maybe helped you out from time to time. You had guardian angels. How many of y'all had guardian angels? You know, somehow you had some little elf-like thing sitting on your shoulder or something. You floated around, followed you, etc. Um, how many of you guys ever read the Bible, though, and you got the impression, you ever wonder if the angels were protecting us from God? You ever wonder about that? Right, remember when God, you know, Eden gets lost here in the story of man's experience and they get kicked out of the garden. And God assigns two cherubim to guard the way back into the garden to keep man out. Because now it's no longer safe for man to go back into the garden to get around the tree of life. Those cherubim guarded man from going where it would not have been good for them to go. When you see Isaiah fall down before the throne of God, there are cherubim standing guard around the throne of God. So when this tabernacle gets lowered down from heaven and you and I get to visit this ark with these beings on it, this, this is like the throne of God being given into our context. And what's going to happen here once a year? And let me just say this against the backdrop of if you believe, if you believe in a religion that if you're just good enough, you can somehow get right with God. If you avoid being as bad as some other people and do a decent job, try your best, right? Right? Um, this Bible would be a lot shorter and it certainly wouldn't have this ridiculous story in it. This is a ridiculous story. Because what happens once a year is on the Day of Atonement, the nation gathers and these two goats get presented. Now before this has even happened, the high priest, in order for him to even be able to do this, he has shed the blood of a bull and he has taken a little bit of that blood on his own behalf and he has gone in he has arranged incense to be burned before God and he has gone beyond the veil and he's taken a little bit of that blood's, that bull's blood and he has sprinkled it on the mercy seat for himself. Then he has gone back out and representing the nation, these two goats are going to be brought together. One of them is going to give up its life and going to be slaughtered and burned on that altar and his blood is going to be taken in beyond both of those veils and behind this veil he's going to take the blood of the lamb and sprinkle it on the mercy seat now you know isn't it funny what we do to God and what we do to the Bible if I bumped into the average Joe on the street and I said hey do you believe that God is merciful most of them would either say, I sure hope so, or yeah, 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 God is merciful. This is the mercy seat of God. This is where God displays his mercy. This is where God says, let me make you known to you, I am merciful. But on that mercy seat is where blood has to be poured every year. As a reminder that in order for the mercy of God to find its way to us, it will take the blood of an innocent one in our place. So do you understand in the Bible, the mercy of God is connected to the bloodshed of his son. 
So if your idea is, you know what, I kind of want to get to know God. I want to, you know, I want to have a better year this year. I, I want to live closer to God. I'm just going to try and be a better person. That's every religion in the world is trying to do that. And this is a ridiculous story. Shedding, sprinkling blood all over a gold box. Are you kidding me? What the heck is all that about? Well, this book seems to be obsessed with it. It seems to not be able to stop talking about it. And it's going to come up over and over and over again until one day the Lamb of God comes. And what this modeled over and over and every year there was a reminder, a reminder, a reminder. If the people of God want to be under the mercy of God, it's not just because God's in a good mood today. He took his medicine. He's in a good mood. He's fine with you today. Oh, he was angry yesterday. Remember the mountain trembled and there was smoke and fire everywhere. But he's in a good mood today. Listen, the mercy of God is not a mood it is when God sees that the innocent has removed the punishment for the guilty. That's where the mercy of God comes from. So to grab an abstract thought and just say, I believe that the God I believe in is very merciful. Can I just tell you, I believe in that God too, but, but my understanding of mercy has a seat with blood on it. So then when I fast forward into the Bible and I get all the way to the New Testament, I learn about this Lamb of God who comes and he sheds his blood to take away the sins of the world. I look at this box now and I go, I get it. I get what he was doing. He was shedding his blood so that the mercy of God could come to me. It's not just some random thing that today I feel like God's kind of for me. I feel like God will be merciful to me. I did something stupid. I did something irresponsible. I hurt somebody. I was negligent again. Whatever. I just feel like, you know, God's just going to be in a good mood today. No, no, no. You, well, you don't really know if God's going to be merciful to you then. You just like to think he would. What if you can know he will? And this helps us to know he will. Because when he sees the blood on that seat, he will extend his mercy into those whose guilt has been transferred to that goat. That's what that high priest did. Before he slaughtered that, he stood on behalf of the nation and he put his hands on that goat and he transferred the sins of the nation to that goat and then that goat died. And then the other goat was released into the wilderness to illustrate as far as the east is from the west has God separated your sins from you. Right? This is all what's in this, this living illustration here. Most significant event in all the Bible has to do with the blood that goes on that mercy seat. And remember, this came down from heaven. So this is not like a hobby that the Israelites had. This is an insight of how the God of the universe is governing all that he has. But let me, let me do this. Let me highlight something else that's here. Because how many of you guys know what next Sunday is? Next Sunday is Pentecost Sunday. All right? And so actually and purposely I have timed us to finish the tabernacle in time for Pentecost Sunday. Because I want us to be aware of something that is screaming at us from the Bible. Screaming at us from this story. Right? Because the tabernacle is God's means of dwelling among men. And the Pe Pentecost is going to be the next installment in this story. Right? So, what you encounter when you encounter the tabernacle is what I'm going to use the word gradation. It's just the word that comes to mind. An observation that gets overlooked here too often is the gradation, the, the gradualness and the grade of experiencing God as you move near to him. Right? One commentator, Peter N., said the three-part structure of the tabernacle Moving from lesser to greater degrees of holiness reflects the gradations of holiness on Mount Sinai. The tabernacle is modeled after a higher cosmic reality, the dwelling place of God. Right, so you have this experience as you move into this last chamber that the degree of radiation, the degree of holiness... The degree of the nearness of God, the experiencing of who he is and what he's like is intensifying as we get to this moment. 
So much so that God says, even though I want this to be a reminder to you over and over and over again, there are going to be morning and evening offerings that are going to be offered, but you're only going to come do this once a year. It's almost like getting too much radiation on you. Once a year, that guy's coming in this close to me. And so God illustrates something here. How many of you can look at this tabernacle story and conclude something? God does not manifest himself exactly the same way everywhere and to everybody. Right, I know right now some of you guys are looking up the number for the ACLU. It's like you want to sue God right now. Wait, wait that's not fair. God's got to be fair, right? Did, have you read your Bible? Fair, you know, you don't want God to be fair for one thing, but God shows up in people's lives one way in this person's life and another way in that person's life. Really rich, deep, amazing experience for this guy, next to nothing for this guy. This nation gets the tabernacle. Nobody else gets it. God has the right to do that. But here's what I don't want us to overlook, though. Experiencing God is not the same everywhere and for everybody. Neither is your experience of God the same today as it could be tomorrow. And that's, so I want to mess with some New Testament theology here in just a minute. Because I think a lot of us sit in the New Testament and go, well, wait a minute, wait, I got it all, man. I got it. I'm in the New Testament. I'm not like these guys in the Old Tabernacle. I'm not, I got it all, baby. Well, we're going to check and see just how much you got in just a minute. But let's, let's just visit God's variation here for a moment. Do you remember, the, here's the storyline, and this is critical. Eden was the place where God was going to dwell with man. Man walked with God in the cool of the evening and enjoyed his presence in his company. Sin intrudes into the story of man and man is booted out of Eden and he forfeits that relationship with God. Now thousands of years are going to, are going to occur after that and God is seldom encountered. At least the Bible records seldom encounters. Every once in a while a patriarch gets a visit from God in some amazing way. And see we've gotten so familiar with this, you know, we've overlooked that at least five, six thousand years, at least, not even clear in the Bible how long it is, uh, transpires before we get to Mount Sinai. So you've got a lot of history and you've got very little dwelling of God among men and then God appears to Abraham and then kind of looks like he goes away for 25 years and Abraham's just waiting around is God going to make good on his promise am I going to have a son 25 years and of course he does and God interacts with him again and starts a nation that eventually God is going to show up at Mount Sinai and say hey I want to move in with you guys I want to restore my presence to you that which was lost I, I want insta- to install it again. But I'm going to do it through this tabernacle. Now, the next time we're going to get an upgrade, Emmanuel is going to come, God with us, and Jesus is going to be the dwelling of God on earth. And he is preparing us for Pentecost. The day in which all this imagery in the Old Testament is about to come to life and the Spirit of God is now going to take up his place in the temples of men. Right, now, this is the story. Now, you do right. There's another installment coming. Well, this, if you don't get this, you've got some crazy theology. If you don't get that what you and I have right now still isn't the end of the story, you will install all kinds of weird stuff. But which, you know, I'm going to sideswipe your. If you're a prosperity person, you've been around a lot of faith teachings, this is where that teaching goes awry. Because it seeks to install everything right now that ought to, some of it should be installed in heaven. And it'll mess you up if you get that installation wrong. But this is what God is restoring to us. He is bringing us back to this place. So when we get to the tabernacle here, there are varying experiences with God. Not everybody's experiencing God the same way at, at the tabernacle, right? So here's God at Mount Sinai. That's the first place they visit. They get Mount Sinai first, then they get the tabernacle. So let's race through this. You guys will remember studying through this months ago. Exodus 19 verse 2. 
There at Mount Sinai, it says, there Israel encamped before the mountain. So a couple of million folks are encamped there around the mountain while, while Moses went up to God. Not everybody? No. One person goes up to God. Exodus 19 verse 10, the Lord said to Moses, go to the people, consecrate them today and tomorrow and let them wash their garments and be ready for the third day. For on the third day, the Lord will come down on Mount Sinai in the sight of the people. On every mountain everywhere, in everybody's house and backyard? No, on Mount Sinai only. And you shall set limits for the people all around, saying, take care not to go up into the mountain or touch the edge of it. All right, so not everybody can go on the mountain. Chapter 19, verse 16. On the morning of the third day, there were thunders and lightnings and a thick cloud on the mountain and a very loud trumpet blast so that all the people in the camp trembled. Then Moses brought the people out of the camp to meet God and they took their stand at the foot of the mountain. Now, Mount Sinai was wrapped in smoke. Listen, this will mean something to you next week because the Lord had descended on it in fire. Can everybody put that word fire in your pocket and come back next week and let's talk about that? Okay, this is the presence of God descending uniquely on this mountain and the image of it is fire. Exodus 19 verse 20, the Lord came down on Mount Sinai to the top of the mountain. All right, now we have some geographical issues here. He's at the top of the mountain in a way that's different than the way he's at the bottom of the mountain. And the Lord called Moses to the top of the mountain and Moses went up and only Moses went up. Exodus 24 verse 1. Then he said to Moses, come up to the Lord, you and Aaron and Nadab and Abihu and 70 of the elders of Israel, and worship from afar. Okay, now a few more are included, but only at a distance. Moses alone shall come near to the Lord, but the others shall not come near, and the people shall not come up with him. Then chapter 24, verse 9, Moses and Aaron, Nadab and Abihu, and the 70 elders of Israel went up. They saw the God of Israel. There was under his feet, as it were, a pavement of sapphire stone like the very heaven for clearness. And he did not lay his hand on the chief men of the people of Israel. They beheld God and ate and drank. The Lord said to Moses, come up to me on the mountain and wait there that I may give you the tablets of stone with the law and the commandment which I have written for their instruction. So Moses rose with his assistant Joshua and Moses went up into the mountain of God. And he said to the elders, wait here until we return to you. And behold, Aaron and Hur are with you. Whoever has a dispute, let him go to them. Then Moses went up on the mountain and the cloud covered the mountain. The glory of the Lord dwelt on Mount Sinai. And the cloud covered it six days. And on the seventh day, he called to Moses out of the midst of the cloud. Now the appearance of the glory of the Lord was like a devouring fire on the top of the mountain in the sight of the people of Israel. Moses entered the cloud and went up on the mountain and Moses was on the mountain 40 days and 40 nights. All right, now, this is God manifesting himself to his people on a mountain. When God gives the revelation of the tabernacle, it's as though he picks up this mountain concept and sticks it in a travel box. And all the stuff that you saw on the mountain is here. Encampment around the tabernacle. The Levites get to be closer. There's a few select elders, if you will. There's a few select priests who get to go into the holy place. And there's only one who gets to go to the summit of the mountain into the holy of holies, the high priest. Right? This is God revealing himself. How many guys can recognize not everybody experienced God the same way in this setting? That's pretty important because it may put me in touch with where I'm at might mean that there's more. There's more for me to experience in the nearness of God than what I already know and what I already possess. 
F.B. E. Meyer says, they were allowed to come near, right? These guys went up on the mountain, got a vision about God that nobody had seen before. The narrative at this point suggests that these favored men were permitted to behold some appearance of the divine being who had invited them for this purpose. You understand, this hasn't happened since the cherubim stood guard in Eden. He said, nobody gets to visit with God anymore. Until God comes back and says, these men may come up and I will give them an awareness of me like nobody else has had. And then Moses goes even farther in his experience. So, so this, is, this is this gradation element. That there are experiences in the nearness of God that vary and that are different from place to place. When the Bible picks up this idea of the most holy place. I, I just pay attention to words, right? So I'm reading the Bible and I say the most holy place. Immediately I know that there are lesser holy places. That word's there for a reason. So there's an experience of holiness, right? And holiness is an experiencing of the character of God. Don't let holiness mean prudishness to you. Don't let holiness mean, you know, persnickety, nobody gets to dress out of lineness. Okay, that's, I don't know what that is, but it's not what we're talking about here. Right? The holiness of God is his character. God's love is holy. God's mercy is holy. So there is an experience of God's holiness here that when I look up on the mountain, I see, wow, that's a different experience than this one right here. When I stand outside the tabernacle and I look at this thing and I say, okay, I get to be the nation of Israel. There's an experience of holiness right there. I get to be part of this nation. But I watch that priest go beyond that first veil and I think there's more. There's more. And then once a year, I watch this guy dressed up specially and he goes beyond the second veil. And I become aware there's even more. See, all this stuff is teaching us about Pentecost. I don't know what it means for some people to be Pentecostal, but to be Pentecostal ought to mean an awareness that there's more. There's more coming, there's more available. There's more over there. And some people get weird with this. Right? Some people do weird stuff with it. I guess that's why they get weird. Here, fast forward with me just for a second. I just want you to catch this. This is contagious. Looking at chapter 33. This is interesting. This is, this is Moses interacting with this concept of an awareness that there's more. We're going to come back to this after the summer. We'll come back to, to the issue of the golden calf and the idolatry issue that breaks out at Mount Sinai. So on the other side of these issues, Moses now is interceding with God. And there's a lot to be learned from that. Let's just learn a couple of things here. Look in verse 12 of chapter 33. Right, so we fast forward in time a little bit. God, he's already come down from the mountain. He's presented the tablets, etc. They haven't, haven't built the ark yet, but... Verse 12, Moses said to the Lord, see, you say to me, bring up this people, right? His, his assignment was to bring them into the promised land. Bring up this people, but you have not let me know whom you will send with me. Yet you have said, I know you by name, and you also found, have found favor in my sight. Now, therefore, if I have found favor in your sight, please show me now your ways that I may know you in order to find favor in your sight. Consider too that this nation is your people. And he said, this is what God said, my presence will go with you and I will give you rest. And he said to him, if your presence will not go with me, do not bring us up from here. There's a message right here and I'm tempted to preach it, but... It would be alarming to many of us to discover how many of us are fine with going on in our religion without the presence of God. Matter of fact, it would be fine. It, it, it will be noticeably that this is what we're after when we read our Bibles this summer in Summer Bible Jam. Because for some of us, it has become okay if we just read our Bibles, but we don't encounter the God of the Bible. But I read my Bible. 
we have gone on without the presence of God. And Moses was unwilling to do that. Moses said, God, I'm not going to pack this tabernacle thing up and take these people into this promised land if your presence stays at this mountain or it's somewhere else. If you don't go with us, there's no reason for us to go anywhere. It was non-negotiable for him. Verse 15, he said to him, if your presence will not go with me, do not bring us up from here for how shall it be known that I have found favor in your sight, I and your people? Is it not in your going with us so that we are distinct, I and your people from every other people in the face of the earth? And the Lord said to Moses, this very thing that you have spoken, I will do for you have found favor in my sight and I know you by name. Moses said, please show me your glory. And God said, I will make all my goodness pass before you and will proclaim before you my name, Yahweh. And I will be gracious to whom I will be gracious. I will show mercy on whom I will show mercy. But he said, you cannot see my face for man cannot see me and live. The Lord said, behold, there is a place by me where you shall stand on the rock. And while my glory passes by, I will put you in a cleft of the rock and I will cover you with my hand until I have passed by. Then I will take my hand away and you shall see my back, but my face shall not be seen. And the next scene is Moses encountering the presence of God. But here's what I am drawn to. After this lesson in the tabernacle, after this awareness of Mount Sinai, and after the life that Moses has lived up to this point, do you have any idea what's in this man's background when he stands before God and he says, Please show me your glory. Moses asked that at this point in his life? Can you backtrack a little bit of Moses' story at this point? Moses is the guy who sees a bush burning on the side of the mountain and walks up and has a conversation with God about one of the most radical events. This this lowly dude is going to take a stick and go before the most powerful human being on earth and demand things from him. And God has sent him to do that and he's going to go do it. He's encountered God in this burning bush. And then he gets to Egypt and one massive plague after another flows from this man's life. He lights fuses for fireworks that no one's ever seen ever. And one thing after another confounds an entire land. This guy has had access to flipping switches in heaven all over the place. He knows something already about the power of God. Then he's going to lead a couple million people out into the wilderness, right? We've, talk, we've covered this before. There's no McDonald's as far as the eye can see. It's just sand. How am I feeding these people? Miraculously. How am I going to cross that Red Sea that we parked next to? Miraculously. How am I going to give water to all these people? It's a desert. Miraculously. You're just going to speak to a rock and water's going to come flowing out of it. You're going to strike a rock and water's going to come flowing out of it. Right, this is what this man has already encountered. Then he's going to go stand in God's presence. God is going to reveal the Ten Commandments to him. This is going to be a high voltage, bright light experience of the, the moral character of God. is going to go on display for this man. He's going to experience that and it's going to get written down for him. And this is not all formality. Moses was a man who had intimacy with God. Right, have you seen this passage in Exodus 33? Same section here. Verse 7 says, Now Moses used to take the tent and pitch it outside the camp, far off from the camp. And he called it the tent of meeting. This is before the tabernacle has been made. So he's got another tent that he's using here. When Moses entered the tent, the pillar of cloud would descend and stand at the entrance of the tent, and the Lord would speak with Moses. Verse 11, it says, Thus the Lord used to speak to Moses 
face to face as a man speaks to his friend. This has been how Moses has been experiencing God. And what's interesting, again, crowd of Israelites watched Moses pitch a tent outside the camp and this smoke gathers over it and Moses goes in and a bunch of people watch the glory of God from a distance. Moses speaks to God face to face. How many of you can see that not everybody experiences God the same way? Deuteronomy 34, verse 7. Moses was 120 years. This is the end of Moses' life. When he died, his eye was undimmed and his vigor unabated. Verse 9, it says, Joshua, the son of Nun, was full of the spirit of wisdom. For Moses had laid his hands on him. How many of you guys know you just don't lay hands on people in the New Testament? How many know that people can be filled with the spirit before you get to the New Testament? That messes up some theology, huh? So the people of Israel obeyed him as, did, as they did as the Lord had commanded Moses. And there, was, there has not arisen a prophet since in Israel like Moses, whom the Lord knew face to face. None like him for all the signs and the wonders that the Lord sent him to do in the land of Egypt, to Pharaoh, to all his servants, to all his land, and for all the mighty power and all the great deeds of terror that Moses did in the sight of all Israel. This is who walks before God one day and says, please, please show me your glory. You got to be kidding me. I think I'd be fine with what I'd seen so far. If this is my experience in life, all that's on my resume, I don't know if I'm desperately going, please, God, I know there's more. I know there's more. Show me more. And then you and I come to the New Testament. And we're New Testament Christians. Now, I have done what I'm about to criticize. So, I've been teaching long enough to slightly regret some of the things that I've taught. Um, we come to the New Testament, and the New Testament looks back on the Old Testament and says, this is better than that. This is an upgrade from that. There's one better than Moses who is here. So Moses kind of gets a downgrade when something better comes along. And then the New Testament gets described as we get to experience things that others long to see that we have. Even angels long for what we have. So there's a lot being acknowledged that you and I have got some serious, serious stuff on paper. And I have argued, and, and, and somewhat rightly, we can argue for that from the standpoint of look what we have, look what we have, look what we have, look what we have in the New Testament. And in many ways, we should argue for what we have. But we also should pay attention to something and not lose something in this. What happened at that tabernacle was a real encounter with God. It wasn't a paper encounter. It wasn't just an awareness of a report of somebody else experiencing God in all these variety of ways. What happened at that mountain, people experienced. What those 70 guys went up there and they saw this sea of glass and this amazing scene that only jewels could describe. That was a real encounter with God that they came back and passed along to others. People really experienced something. They didn't just have on paper that they acknowledged that this is their experience. They actually experienced it. And so when we get to Pentecost, guess what? There's experiences in Pentecost. It's not just a paper transaction. It's not supposed to just sound like, isn't, aren't you and I just the wealthiest people in the Bible? Because truly, we are more wealthy than Moses was. That's a big statement, isn't it? When you just read Moses' resume, I appreciate what's happened in the New, Te New Covenant. But I would be sitting at Moses' feet learning 
about the glory and the presence of God. He would not be sitting at mine. Although what's come to me in the New Testament is greater than what came to Israel in the Old Testament. But how many of you guys are humble enough to know that that might not be that we've experienced all that? Because Moses came out of that tent from afar. I don't know what he looked like. Sometimes it says he, the glory was so bright on him that people actually, Moses, I can't even look at you, man. I mean, just the, the shining of God's glory off of you. And Moses had, the Bible says, had to wear a veil because Whatever happened, that radiation moment where God revealed his greatness to Moses, it's, it clung to him like light. And he walked out of that tent and people couldn't look at him. He was so bright that they had to put a veil over him. His experience was different than the guys way over there. And I sure hope the guys way over there were going, wow, there's more. I hope they weren't going, I'm good. I don't want any of that. I don't want to know God that way. Even if God made it possible for us to know him that way, which is coming in the New Testament, I don't want to know him that way. I'm good. That thing afar, I'm good. Right, when the New Testament writers, this is not just my issue here, I'm going to de-romanticize New Testament theology here. But the New Testament writers did that. It's all over the place. I'm just going to rush you through a couple of them here just so you can get a taste for it and make sure you realize I'm not a heretic by saying this. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 1. Paul says, but I, brothers, right? Who's he speaking to? Christians. New Testament Christians. I, brothers, could not address you as spiritual people. Why? Because they were not spiritual people? Because they didn't have the Spirit of God? They weren't born again? They weren't filled with the Spirit and dwelt by the Spirit? None of that was true about them? No, on paper, all of that was true about them. But Paul says, I can't speak to you as spiritual people, but as people of the flesh, as infants in Christ. I fed you with milk, not solid food, for you were not ready for it. And even now you're not yet ready, for you are still of the flesh. For while there's jealousy and strife among you, are you not of the flesh and behaving only in a human way? But there's more. All right, I know that's not in there. But do you hear that in the Apostle Paul? Him saying there's more for you than that. There's more for your experience of God than behaving in such a fleshly way to where you are, instead of being filled with the Spirit of God, you're filled with jealousy and comparisons with one another. But there's more. Right, that's what I hear him say. 1 Corinthians 12, he fast forwards a good bit into that same letter. He says, now concerning spiritual gifts, brothers, I do not want you to be uninformed. Because there's more, right? And there are Christians in that passage who on paper have an incredible wealth of gifts available to them. But in reality, they are Paul's word, uninformed. You don't know anything about this, do you? But on paper, you're as charismatic as they get. But in your experience, not necessarily. Hebrews chapter 5. The writer of Hebrews says, About this we have much to say. There's more. And it's hard to explain since you have become dull of hearing. For though by this time you are to be teachers. You need someone to teach you. Again, the basic principles of the oracles of God. You need milk, not solid food. All right, how many of you guys know that solid food represents more? This is the writer of the New Testament talking to Christians who on paper are the wealthiest people in all the Bible until you get to heaven. Then you're even wealthier. But at this point, these are the wealthiest people in the story of God. And the writer of the Hebrews is saying the same thing that Paul's saying. There's more. All you've known is milk. There's more. But solid food's for the mature, for those who have their powers of discernment trained by constant practice to distinguish good from evil. One more. Philippians chapter 3. 
Right. This, this is a Moses moment here. This is a man who was converted to God, not yesterday when he's writing this. This is 25 years since the Apostle Paul met Christ on the road to Damascus. So he's been saved for 25 years. And he's going to sound just like Moses. Paul's got quite a resume at this point. Paul has done some amazing things. He's experienced a lot about God. And he's going to say this. That I may know him the power of his resurrection and may share his sufferings becoming like him in his death that by any means possible I may attain the resurrection from the dead not not that I have already obtained this or I'm already perfect but I press on to make it my own because Christ Jesus has made me his own brothers I do not consider that I have made it my own. But one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead. This is the Apostle Paul standing and saying, please show me your glory. After 25 years of incredible ministry, the dude's raised the dead, he's preached and people have come to Christ, miracles have taken place through his life and he stands and he says, more. I want more. Let's read this last passage together. Eric, you can go ahead and make your way up here. Ephesians. Apostle Paul turns this prayer for more into his prayer for the church. Right? These are Christians he's praying for. These are not people that he hopes to become Christians. That they might have some of this stuff on paper. These dudes got it together on paper. They're New Testament Christians. He's praying for them in verse 14, chapter 3. He says, For this reason I bow my knees before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth is named, that according to the riches of his glory, he may grant you to be strengthened with power through his Spirit in your inner being. Apparently, there's more. Whatever strength they have at this moment in their lives, it could be incredible. It could be waning. Not everybody's experience is the same. But apparently, Paul says, there's more inner strength for you. And I'm praying that you would experience it and know it. So that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. That you being rooted and grounded in love. Not just having love on paper. Yet people who have never picked the Bible up who believe God loves them. They know nothing about anything we've explored. They, don't, they haven't explored the word of God. They're just throwing a phrase around. What a sad thing when we just throw a phrase around. No, Paul says, I don't want you throwing a phrase around. God loves me. God loves me. God loves you. No, no, no. I, I'm praying for much more than that for you. That you being rooted and grounded in that love may have strength to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge that you may be filled with all the fullness of God that you may be filled oh that's all right Paul I've read the New Testament I'm filled I got it all I got it all when I got converted I don't even know what you're praying about here Paul what y'all jazzed up about have you read your own writings How many of you guys know that Paul knew what he wrote? And he still turned around and said, I'm praying for you that you may be filled the fullness of God because there is more for you. If you guys didn't read this book last summer, this, I mean, go back and reread it this summer. Tim Keller's book on prayer is just exceptional. And then he says, what kind of experience should be expected? How should it be sought? Paul prays for his readers that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith and that they may know this love of Christ. Finally, he prays that they would be filled with all the fullness of God. These Ephesian readers, however, were all Christian believers. In Ephesians 1, he teaches that by being united with Christ, we already have the fullness of God in them. Why is he asking God to give Christians things they must 
already have? There can be only one answer. At one level, Christians have these things. At another level, they haven't experienced them. What Paul is talking about is the difference between having something be true in, in principle and fully appropriating it, using it and living in it, in your inner being or in your heart. There's more. There's more encounter with God. The God who wants to dwell among us wants to be near to us, wants to affect us, wants us to experience him. He wants that. And you and I need that. And let, let me clean up one other little messy New Testament idea. Sometimes the New Testament installs it because this stuff is true on paper that it should be always true of us in every moment of our experience. And yet that's not in the Bible either. There are moments when God showed up before Moses in ways that made him glow like a light bulb, and then there were moments when God didn't show up in Moses' life. And I think the New Testament experience would have some of that as well. It's not as though, you know, if you were really a serious Christian, you'd open the Bible up, and when you walked out, your children would be blinded by your presence. You know, <laughs> uh, no, probably not. But does that mean you'd never have encounters with God? that leave indelible marks on you, that are unusual visitations, moments with God. That seems to be God's history with people. And we should have some of that. Tim Keller writes in his book, Blaise Pascal was a Christian believer and philosopher and one of the great minds of history. When he died, it was discovered that he had sewn into the inner lining of his coat the description of an experience he had one night. It read... In the year 1654, Monday, 23rd November, from about 10.30 in the evening until half an hour after midnight, fire, God of Abraham, God of Isaac, God of Jacob, and not of the philosophers and of the learned. Certainty, certainty, feeling, joy, peace. Pascal was not talking about a sight of literal flames, but rather an experience of the presence of God. What fire in the Bible so often represents. Now, I don't, I don't think Blaze was supposed to have that encounter again on November 24th. And then maybe another one like that on November 25th. But I, I think that there is more. When I read the Bible, I stand and I look and I see there's people standing too far away. And their experience of God is from a distance. And they can only tell stories about clouds way over there. And people who seem to encounter God way over there. But they can't tell these stories themselves. And then Pentecost happens. And as we'll see next week, we go from one address where the fire settles to an infinite number of addresses where the fire of God settles and the glory of God now has come near to us in a way that we can't imagine and yet for some of us it's still at a distance how many of you guys believe God wants more so the real question is, do I want more? Two things I just want to ask you to prepare a little bit for. One of the things that we're doing this summer in Summer Bible Jam, every summer, if you're new to the church, every summer we devote the summer months to falling in love with the Bible again, to spending time in God's Word, to learning and being encountered by that word. So we're going to do that again this year, but we're going to do something a little bit different. We're going to learn how to meditatively read the Bible. So we're not going to read a lot of the Bible. We're going to read a little bit of the Bible, and we're going to extract a lot from it. And we're going to learn to encounter God in passages. And so that's what Summer Bible Jam is going to do, because I believe God wants us to experience more of his nearness. Let us draw near.
brothers. That's what the Bible calls us to do. Next week is Pentecost Sunday. And it's amazing, the Christian universe doesn't completely ignore it, but everybody knows when Christmas is, don't you? Can I just tell you right now, Pentecost, now I understand this, Pentecost can't happen without Christmas, I get that. You can't have Pentecost without the Incarnation, I get that. But when the Old Testament looks for the day, it wasn't looking for Christmas. It was looking for Pentecost. Oh, by the way, it wasn't necessarily looking even to the cross because remember the cross that altar that happens in the outer court it's intended to take us somewhere because if you come to the altar and you slay your animal and blood gets shed and that sacrifice is put down right there and you never make your way beyond that second veil into the presence of God that thing didn't do what it was supposed to do for you It's supposed to take you into the presence of God. What was lost in Eden was the nearness and life-giving presence of God. What's being restored all throughout the Bible is that. So when the tabernacle stands and gazes into the New Testament, it's longing for Pentecost. That's what it's waiting for. Because the presence of God is going to come near to each and every one of us. I can say this, I think, and be safe. It's as big a day in the Christian calendar as Easter because Easter takes place to accomplish this. Listen, if all you and I had, can you imagine if Pentecost didn't come after Easter? So Jesus dies, he takes our place, he's resurrected, the justification of God is stamped upon him, he has new life and he doesn't draw near to us. And you just keep visiting a building where the presence of God makes itself known over there and you keep coming together for these festivals every year you just keep doing that this is a big day Pentecost is an enormously important day in the Christian calendar in our lives so let's do this this is why we're the timing of why we've studied this is to get us prepared for the summer and to get us prepared for Pentecost So that next week we can be looking to the presence of God coming to us the way God desires for that presence to come to us. And then this summer to be able to open God's word and sit with him and experience his nearness in our lives. So that's where we're headed. Let's stand up together. Lord, your plans that were in your heart that you have introduced your desire to dwell among us to make your life manifest to us to bring the mystery of who you are into the setting of where we live well that was your idea You taught all these lessons and gave all these images so that one day the fire of your presence might return to the place from which it was lost in Eden. Oh, Lord, what a story. What a story of your grace and your love and your persistence and your patience. Your tenacity to never quit, to fully accomplish all that's been in your heart. Lord, I don't want to stand at a distance from that. Lord, I don't want to be those who see somebody else's experience only. But I want to know something of your nearness to me. 
And Lord, I'm in good company to stand and to plead. Lord, please show us your glory. Show us more, Lord. Pull back the veil of our understanding, our limited knowledge, our own ideas, our lack of experience, all that we impose, all the obstacles that get in the way. God, pull back the veil. Lord, there was a day when man stood powerless to sever that veil, and you ripped it, Lord. You tore it away so that we could have access to you. And God, we live in the day of access. That's where we live. That's the address that we live in today. And God, there's going to be a fuller address to live in one day. But Lord, the one we live at right now is a pretty amazing one. It's a pretty profound one. It's a deeply impacting one. God, we don't want to stand at a distance from that. God, we want to stand together as a people bound to one another and bound to you to say, Lord, show us more. Show us more of your glory, God. Show us more of your love. Show us more of your mercy, God. Show us more of your power. God, show us more of your righteousness. God, show us the depth of mercy. God, show us the height and depth and width of a love like no other love. God, show us mercy that's got blood stains on it. There must be more, God. And we know there is. So God, our prayer is, would you show us more? Show us more, Lord. Show us your glory. Be in our midst, oh God. Draw near to us and Stir us that we might draw near to you. There must be more than this. O oh, breath of God, come breathe within. There must be more than this. Spirit of God, we wait for you. Fill us anew, we pray. Fill us anew, we pray. Consume fire.
to come like a rushing wind. Come like a rushing wind. Clothe us with power from on high. Now set the captives free. Leave us abandoned to your praise. Let your glory fall. Sin to me, the sight of 
that know how to see you. We want to have hearts that long for you, that long for your presence, that long to draw near to you. But we don't need to be gathered in this building on Sunday mornings for that to happen. Lord, you have, through your Son, given us 24-7 access to your presence. And so we want to draw near. Lord, help us to draw near to you this week. Lord, help us to, to set time aside to do this. Lord, give us an appetite. Lord, give us a longing for you. Lord, don't let us, don't let us waste the invitation that you are giving to us this morning to draw near. Lord, help us to experience more of you this week, God, as we leave this place. Lord, so may that be so, God. And we don't trust in our own effort. We don't trust in our own resolve. Lord, we trust in your spirit, the spirit of God that dwells inside of us. We trust in the power of Christ that's been given to us through that spirit, Lord. So we go away from this place, not wondering if this is possible, but being sure, God, you want to draw near to your people, Lord. And so if we, if we comply with you, you will show yourself. God, so do that in our midst, we pray. In your name. In your name. You guys have a blessed week.